we still quick attack. J just in case, maybe we speed tie. All right. Looks like it's up and going. Uh, talk more about this later. This is a video component to hopefully both back up a talk I'm going to do and get some better camera angles because I can't really move my camera on the computer. So I'm just trying to get this set up before we go. Do, do, do. Let's see. Those are all past live streams. Let's see. Where do I go to my current live stream? If I click on this, will it just go? It is just going. All right. Let's get the lights on. There's that. Let's get Zoom up and going. Oh, that's a lot of things. Oh, it helps if I click on the on the right computer. Yes, I'm sure I want to open 35 tabs. Are you sure you want to open 35 tabs? Still waiting on that.
if you ate them all, you're going to get fat. Valentine's Day, everyone. Welcome in. Welcome in. <laughs> also, happy snow day, you know. It looks like uh, I just saw 100% chance uh, all morning, it looks like. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I've seen that a lot living in the South for like many years, uh, so that doesn't guarantee anything, but it would be cool. It would be cool to actually have some snowfall. Like sticking snow? Like, it's uh, high 20s, but not that high 20s, like 26 to 28 tomorrow morning. I would cry. I would be just so excited. <laughs> I, I, I left Boston in part to get rid, away from the snow because I, I, I don't dislike it, but, but when it's on the ground for three months straight, it, it loses its novelty. So I'm just like, I'm eh. talking about Matt. I lived, in, uh, I lived in Washington for two years, and it was awesome. Three months on the ground is not enough. It could be like eight months and be totally fine. I don't know. I was. It, it was must be different in Washington. The uh, West Coast That's snow. True. Yeah, I mean, like uh, East Coast snow is different, and we were in a high altitude too. So I might do. I was, you know, Boston's pretty much on the sea level, so. Yeah, it's uh, pretty humid there too, and it wasn't really humid. Yeah. Over, so maybe Portland it'll be different. Is, Portland is pretty well covered in snow. And, where I used to live, there's a thick layer of ice on everything, and they public transit has stopped running because it's unsafe for yeah. buses and the light rail to be out. Yeah, Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the only time they canceled school or anything like that when I was in uh, Washington and working in Idaho um, was when it was kind of like how um, the conditions are here, where it's like kind of freezing rain possible possibilities when it's right around freezing. But like snow on the road, like tires can like move it over, but when it's that when it's frozen it's flat. So yeah, that's good. Yeah. Cool. Um well uh should we get started here? My Matt, I did I um you're gonna be taking the lead on this one tonight. So uh, if you are ready I guess we can go ahead and begin, I just have one little Welcome announcement, and let me pull it up. Um, but again, the SEI National Conference, right? That's pretty big, um, pretty good to know about. It's due this week, right? So it seems like, you know, I think maybe it was last week, I was like, oh yeah, they just posted it. <laughs> and then, or the last time we met, we just posted it. So it's due this week. Uh, I have the, let me go ahead and put the link in chat. Uh, it's due this, uh, let's see, my, Party. I think Friday. I think it's due this Friday. So uh, you do need only payment for anything for any, for any opportunities this year. Uh, and there you go. And again, like they have all the other awards we talked about. So check that out. Book market. Make sure to apply. Um, I think they're looking a lot more for you know pieces that have recordings already because it, it won't be a sort of live capacity to this event. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Hi, right, cool. Well, um, without further ado, uh, everybody, welcome Matt Barden, a PhD student, an EMDM minoring composition here. Uh, yeah, and has an incredible assortment of gear. So I'd love to hear what he has to say about gear for composers, the sort of essentials and the sort of um, fun things I have and all that sort of stuff. So Matt, take it away. Cool. All right. So it looks like it's just a few of us, so we can get into this. Uh, I'm going to do things slightly weird. Uh, I'm going to put a link in the chat right now. So I've got a other camera, which you may have noticed in Zoom, right here, just as a way to get slightly better angles and back stuff up, because I, I really can't move this camera. So it's kind of pointless if I'm like, and here's this thing, but it's way over there, and I can't show it to you. Um, so I'll have that uh, online. But it might there'll be a little delay between what you hear in Zoom and what you see on here. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to think where I can get started. I've also got a bunch of tabs of 
possible different things. Uh, oh, hold on. The website wants to verify that I'm not actually a robot because I just saved these and got the weird thing where I've never had Chrome ask me if I was sure I wanted to open that many tabs at once before because uh, I just saved them in a bookmark folder. So one second. All right. There we are. We'll come back to that later. All right. So I, yeah, if uh, anyone wants to go in a certain direction, feel free to push me that way, and then we'll uh, you know figure out where we want to go. Um, but I figured I would talk a bit about uh, some software-y stuff up front and then go into different kinds of some hardware things that I think might be useful. So let's see, I should be able to desktop one. I don't know if I'll play sound, but I'll share it just in case. All right, let's move us out of the way. All right, so um, in terms of software, I think there's probably just a few things that uh, people kind of really should have and be at least mildly familiar with uh, doing composing and editing and stuff like that. Uh, one of them is obviously a, a notation software of some kind. I mean, it would be great if someone, you know, you had someone who, uh, you know, did, made all your parts for you and, uh, you know, engraved all your stuff. But in reality, that that's not as easy to come by as it was previously. Um, at least, the, I should say that the amount of, like, the, the composer to engraver ratio is uh, a little off compared to what it was. Let me turn something down. All right. Um, so let's see. Do, do, do. I've got a lot of stuff on this computer. Where'd it go? Notation. Um, I've got these three ones here. Um, I mainly use Sibelius. Uh, I, I used to use Finale more when I was an undergrad, and then before that I just used... That's actually not even MuseScore. I don't know where MuseScore even went. Um, oh well, I haven't used that one since I was... for a while. Um, I really don't think that there's one that's significantly better or worse than the others, and there's other ones outside of these. Um, I, I think they all kind of suck. Um, it just kind of depends on what <laughs> on what you're doing and what you're wanting to work with. Um, but that being said, I usually hold off on using these for a little while until I've got at least a, a nice solid outline and draft kind of written out on paper so I know what I'm doing. And I, I find at least myself, I like the music I'm ending up with more um, when I'm using this as a notation software as it's intended and not a composition software as a lot of people sometimes do. Um, like I said, it's, uh, I've noticed that more, at least with uh, some, some of like the people that are kind of starting out uh, in undergrads and things like that, not to just generalize, but that's just what I've seen. But I think the the further back you can push off using the notation software, the the better you'll like your music, and the less the the problems you might run into with these you, you would experience. Um, so at that with that point, then it doesn't really it just whichever one you like the workflow of or the you know can do things easiest, go with that one. Um, um, do you know the publisher C. F. Peters? I think they've done a lot of, uh, I don't know, like Chrome is with them and yeah. uh, almost any major uh, American, but also some, I think, Berg, and maybe they publish Chopin and stuff too. So they just have like a yeah. huge catalog of certain composers. Uh, they say all notation software sucks. I know some publishers there. Uh, they're like, they all are terrible. We have to go in and do our own thing. Um, and, uh, you know, they use Sibelius, but really it's like barely Sibelius. They have so many presets and formats and everything. So it really like really picky like they all suck <laughs> yeah no they there's there's not a good one um, there's some that are less bad than others so it, it ultimately just turns out to what do you like the look of better and what can you work the most efficiently in um, I'll talk I'm gonna talk about DAWs and things like that a little bit later but that'll be a, a something we'll come back to um, do I actually have a thing installed where we can see this I'm not sure if I do um, but the other thing I want to talk about is a uh, like a sound library. So I think that if you can, getting the live performance of you know 
everything is, is the best way to get a good uh, representation of what your music sounds like. However, that's not always possible or feasible, especially with things how they are right now. Um, so having some kind of decent sound library is uh, kind of a key to making your, your little demo videos and recordings better than just the, the default sounds. Because I think everyone has heard the the default finale sounds a million times and they all know that it's, it's bad and it's gross. Uh, and it, it can kind of give you an idea of what it's going to sound like, but not really. Um, I have a thing in the chat. I don't see my chat. Where'd you go, Fanatic? Where'd you go, Zoom? Come back. Okay. Oh, the uh, yes. Thomas sent a thing to a note performer. Another. Um, that's actually the one I was going to talk about. Um, I was going to say uh, note performer. Since Thomas sent the link, let me open up yet another tab on my browser. Computer's a little chugging because of that. Um, I think for the price. This is actually one of the, the better ones, um, if not the best one, just for the, the price. It's, uh, it's like 130 150 bucks, something like that. Uh, you can buy it all at once, um, or you can do the rent to own. It's 130 but the rent to own, so you're only, you pay 11 bucks a, a month for a year, and then you just own it and stop paying for it. So I recommend for people who you know don't really have a a sound library outside of the very basic ones um, look into this because you can try it and if you hate it, it you're you know at worst out like 30 bucks um, and then it's gone rather than having to buy the whole thing um, so I mean, it's got a, a bunch of instruments it sounds decent uh, if you want I can play something that's got this loaded in or they've got um, and they've got some things that were made in it. Uh, I'm just scrolling through. Anything exciting? Do, 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 do. So these sound libraries, Matt, these are ones that uh, integrate with your current notation software. We're not talking like working with a DAW or anything. For this kind of sound yes. Uh, I just wanted to find something to give an example. Nothing sticking. Uh, here. I'll I'm just playing a, a little bit, so um, I mean, you can tell it, it's um, it's still uh, you know computer generated, but it's a lot better than just the the very basic you know MIDI synthesizer sounds. And this one in particular, you once you've got it installed, it uh, will load into each of these notation softwares um, automatically. And in fact, if I wanted to, I'll open up this thing I'm working on right now. Um, we'll see uh, how long this takes to load uh, just to kind of show you how it works and this will work pretty much the same way with um, any of those three uh, notation softwares it had on the program and then see it pops up boop you've got note performer 3 and then it this one starts and that starts and I get my little spinny pinwheel of death It usually doesn't take too long to start up. And then I say that, and then it uh, takes super long to start up. Um, if this doesn't go into the next minute or two, I'm going to move on just for the sake of time. Oh, well, there we go. Um, so again, thing I'm working on, don't steal my stuff. Um, but basically, when you go into the, the playback configurations of all your stuff uh, you have the op you select note performer and it's different in every notation software but it's essentially the same thing um, and it, it essentially just works almost like a plug-in uh, for your program um, it's not perfect I mean uh, actually let me I don't even know if this is set to go through zoom zoom all right, um, so it's not perfect as you will see right now. All 
I'm not going to play any more of that uh, for the sake of time. But you can see it, it's still very, uh, you know, in time and perfect. Um, but it, again, it's just nicer timbres. There's other ones that they have, that, uh, but they tend to work more, at least better with DAWs. Uh, but you can utilize them in these notation softwares. Um, the one I would recommend is uh, East West has some good libraries. They have a large variety, but it's pricey. Um, they do offer one thing where it's like a subscription service and you get everything for like 20 bucks a month. Uh, that's still like 20 bucks a month and you may or may not use it all the time. Um, but the way those tend to work with DAWs, uh, which one do I want to open? Let's go with Logic, because I can. Um, those essentially get loaded in like a synthesizer. Um, and East-West specifically is a sample-based one. So someone went in and recorded all of these specific sounds and then set it to be the specific uh, values in the computer. Um, just a real quick how you use that. It's scanning for these these instruments. Um, basically what I would do is uh, in my notation software uh, you can, in just about any one of, one of them, you can and this is getting a little chuggy. All right. uh, you can uh, save things as a to do as a MIDI file and you can import that MIDI file into um, into your DAW right here. I'm, this is taking forever and I want to talk more about actual gear, so I'm going to not go any farther, but oh, and then now we go. But basically, you just say, hey, put, you know, set my synthesizer to be this one particular uh, sound library, and um, basically, you set each channel, each instrument to match up with that one, and then you can get a, a usually pretty decent. Um, audio recording um, without having to have actual performers. I'm going to talk about having um, actual performers and recording them and doing your stuff that way in a second, uh, but what I want to bring up real quick as I scroll through my tabs, not that one, not that one, not that one, not that one, there we are, starting here. Um, come on, come on computer. It's trying very hard. Um, are some little uh, MIDI controller devices. So, when using the notation software, I think it works great once you've you know got a, a hang of whichever one you're using. Uh, however, it can be a little slow. Um, it's a lot of times by default you're either you know learning a bunch of keyboard commands or you're having to click and place your notes. Uh, getting something like this. Uh, uh, so yeah, Thomas was just saying, um, yeah, uh, blah, 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 blah. I was looking in the chat, um, yeah, no, um, no performer will be the one I would go with for easily working with, um, in a notation software, David, uh, just like Thomas said, but it's, uh, you, you can work out just about any of them in the notation software, it just, it, it makes it harder to work with. I've had I've had trouble with them before, but no performer just it loads nice and quick and easy. Um, anyway. Yeah, I think if it's like a single, like if it's a solo work, maybe you can find if like you had a, like maybe an APO solo clarinet library, probably what I would go with there instead of no performer. No performer works great though when you have like large ensembles. Um, it really like everything blends together. So I think and the voices there, if you go on their website, they have a few I think um, that you can click on. I mean, you can't do the cool syllable stuff like you can with other, you know, like doll stuff, um, but, but it's still pretty good for what it is. I'm, l I'm less concerned with having a word builder in there and like completely synthesizing the choral sound. I just, like, like Hannah, sometimes I've changed it to, to brass just for the articulation. Um, I just don't want it to sound like Final Fantasy three. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to sound like Final Fantasy years three, ago. but I totally understand. Yeah. Where you're <laughs> uh, no, no, the voices are terrible. And yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, voices are definitely better than like 
the the default so like i it makes me want to die a little bit less so <laughs> yeah i think um yeah I, I would agree with hannah the, the woodwinds um and the just uh voices uh in general are probably my least favorite of all of them um i think that the east west library again has some some good voices at least i think but but it's just so expensive i, I don't want to spend 500 dollars on a pack of voices um I'd, I'd rather go have people actually sing it um Sure. So it, uh, it's it's a little hard to do right now. You get a discount instead of twenty dollars a month. It's a ten dollar a month. Oh, well, that's uh, that's not too bad. Up. But yeah, like Hannah said, Spitfire is awesome. So yeah, yeah. You don't really want to check, it, check out what they have. I'll have to look into that. Um, all right. Well, uh, the next thing I want to get into is just ways to input your your data into those notation softwares. Um, they make, as I'm sure you've seen before, if not used, uh, MIDI keyboard controllers. Um, they make a variety of them. Uh, this is the one I have at home. Um, and basically, all the ones I would recommend. Okay, I want to make this go away. Hide me. Uh, hide floating meeting controls. There we go. Um, uh, but basically, all the ones I would recommend. There's a cheaper version of the one I use. Um, this one's decent and I'll keep this one on the screen as well, is having, you know, keys. It doesn't have to be a full-sized keyboard, um, but having some combination of, of these programmable knobs and buttons, uh, at least I find um, if you're doing things both uh, in DAWs or uh, computer music in general, having the variety of programmable data inputs really makes your life a lot easier. Um, so, I mean, you can get by with just the keyboard if you're only using it to put uh, keys in your um, in your scores, but it's a little more flexible if you get something that can do both, uh, and it, it just, it'll save you money for having to buy uh, multiple things. So, they usually aren't too big. If you, uh, yeah, want to look on the other screen, I've got, this is a bet, this was a, a rough idea, I'm trying to be flexible. It's, you know, it takes up a little bit of space just back there. Nothing too big. Um, I think the um, the 25 to, you know, nothing bigger than like 61 keys uh, is great for just setting up like a desk and still being portable if you need to move it around. Um, but just having some way to relatively quickly input your data will, will make your life a lot easier. Um, like I said, I, I've got a variety of ones that I've used before and enjoyed, and um, this is the one I use the most right here. Uh, it's a little more, little more pricey though, but you can usually find them uh, for between 100 to 250 bucks for a, a decent one. Um, there's a few other ones as well that I'll I'll talk about uh, with some recording things, but uh, it's another essentially the same kind of thing with a, just a MIDI input, but it's essentially a little mixer. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about these a little bit later, but it's the same kind of thing where it's just a way to input MIDI data into your software. Um, any other questions or comments about that kind of thing? Most of my gear kind of stuff is more towards uh, like various, uh, you know, slightly post-composing things because I think most people, you know, have some kind of way to notate their stuff um, and update their sounds, but it's after that that I think uh, it's a it's a you know not as many people have it and can do it, and they can potentially suffer down the line for something that can be easily fixed. So, so does anyone have anything they want to specific? For the the Akai key, the first keyboard you showed us, or even the second one, I guess both of them, um, with like the the pads can you like program your own patches into those and like like what do you use those how does that work right. so um these are drum pads and uh give me like 20 seconds Figured it'd be easier to just go get that 
that one um, instead of having to demonstrate with the camera like I just did. But essentially, they're just little uh, pads, and you, you can hit them. I don't know if you can hear it, but... Um, and they're pressure sensitive. So um, in certain... Um, I'll say in DAWs, uh, if you're trying to record a percussion track, you can set each pad to be a specific part of the drum, and you can, like, you know... You can do that. Uh, in Max a lot, too, I've gone in and said, you know, this specific pad does whatever I want it to do, and you can trigger stuff by hitting the pad. Um, yeah, I think each pad is tied to a MIDI note, and then I think yeah. even if you just, it's almost on screen, but like you can change which note, I think it's like set or something, that you can change the, um, maybe that's octave or something, but you can change which ones those eight are applied to pretty simply. Yeah. Um, I guess that one as well. And if it doesn't work with the one synth you're trying with, it's not hitting the right drums. Drum kits and yeah. You can swap it. Yeah, it just say it really depends on um, what you're using it in, but that's a, basically it's basically just a a pressure sensitive little pad you can hit to trigger something via MIDI, um, but it'll just connect to your computer and uh, and there you go. Uh, this one I like because it's it's small. It's uh, probably our smallest decent one, but the the keys are a little flimsy. Um, I don't know if you can kind of see how that is. It's real thin um, right there. So this this one's okay. Um, I would I wouldn't take it a bunch of places, um, but if just for like a small thing, it, it would work fine. Um, but yeah, I usually set up the the pads to do stuff, and I use the knobs for like mixing or panning and things like that. But, uh, but yeah, that's what those do, um, and I just. I like having having them built into one device instead of having a separate set of pads that you also have to plug in and take up another USB port. Um, so yeah. Anything else? I may depending on other questions, I may run over and get other gear that I forgot to move over here. So I think all the keyboards you showed have this, but like and it, on the on this one in particular, so like having a pitch bend, something that can pitch bend like and let you improvise with that feature. Uh, it's like a pretty, I don't know, this was, yeah. that wasn't that common like up until maybe five years ago or so. Like, And now every keyboard, I think, has something like that. Yeah, just so. about. This this one, um, if you're looking at the screen, has it on the that kind of top left. Um, this one here, they're not labeled, but it, one's a pitch bin and one's programmable, just like this one. Um, so I, I think that's a, a useful feature as well because that's also just MIDI data. Uh, so you can see that reflected in your your stuff on the computer. Um, I like this one because they're all they light up. But um, and there's like one keyboard now that like every it the every key is pitch bendable or something. Oh, is, is, are you talking about the C board? Uh, maybe so. I haven't I haven't played one. I have, uh, I just saw that one. Is Rolly? I have one. Yeah, they're called Rolly C. But yeah, they're this. literally so cool. I got it. For film scoring and it like comes with all of the its own like patches pre-programmed and you can like play it's really fun and then they they have all sorts of like i have a smaller one than that because they're expensive Don't as well. they are. <laughs> but there's like an attachable like block like you can add continue adding blocks to them so you can like make investments over time and they have i'm not really sure i know they have one that like does pads similar to the akai but like it's you have more control over like the way the sound happens, but I don't know. It's like a touch screen fancy. Yeah, it's thing. it's like a it's like a keyboard, but you it has touch sensors. Like you can hit them, and you can move up and down and left to right. And you can program how it works. I think it's super cool, but I just think it feels weird on my fingers, and I don't like to touch it. Um, but I think the concept is super cool. Um, all right. Anything else? That's on my wish list, I guess, so that. And then the electronic wind instrument, that's another one that sends, like, cool MIDI data. And... Oh, yeah, th those are those are fun. Uh, here, here's that little block one where it's a little smaller. Um, I could pull up, here's that, the one where it's, like, the pads, um, but you can program, it's like a digital thing. Um, I could pull up that wind instrument if people want to see what it looks like. I think it's super cool. As a wind player, it's also super cool. Uh, it's just, but I mean, it's just another one of those. That's definitely like you know, if if it's something that works in your setup and it's something you're comfortable with, 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead and pull it up, Matt. Why not? I don't, I don't own one. Uh, let's see. I don't own one either, so it's on the wish list. But uh, it, it's another mini uh, controller um, so that, that is not as expensive. Yeah, yeah there, there's a bunch of different ones and different brands. Um, i trying to think which one I've seen. I think I've seen the... Uh, this is the one I've seen once before. Like, I've used one once. And that's just because I didn't own it. Uh, it was not this one, now that I get a bigger picture. But basically, you, you blow into it, and there's a sensor here that transmits the, the blowing into, like, volume data. And then the different combinations of buttons tell it what notes to make. Um, I've seen some that are... Uh, like laid out like more like saxophones and clarinets. Yeah, I mean the fingerings on almost all wind instruments, just because of how acoustics work and stuff, are very similar. They're just yes. different keys, so like figuring out which note is which and all that sort of stuff. Um, so the fingerings themselves aren't so complicated, and that's kind of how all of these work. So like you know, if you're in a musical pit or something, you have a reed player and they play all of it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you'd have to learn fingerings and stuff a little bit, and uh, but I mean, if you like, even just a cursory knowledge of it, it might be interesting. It's definitely definitely designed for like wind players who are transitioning to like, and most of the time you wouldn't use this to play, uh, you know, a MIDI sound or something. Use it for like a cool synth, right, and make these cool like bends and all this sort of stuff that you couldn't do uh, easily with a MIDI yeah. keyboard. Yeah, I was gonna say I'd like to try one, but I don't know if I'd use it enough. I might, I might as a wind player, but uh, you know, I, I dig them. Um, right, I'm going to minimize this for now and come back to it. Um, what I want to talk about next is kind of post-writing stuff, essentially being able to record your own pieces. I think that's a thing that's important for composers to be able to do uh, because you're, you're not always going to have access to concert services and things like that and be able to... Um, you know, record things in a live, you know, in a concert setting all the time. Um, so I think just having the flexibility to make a recording, even if it's super basic, is something that's super important. Um, so I'm going to spend just a second moving tabs over here um, and kind of going through them. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. I, I got a variety of these at different price points. So I just wanted to kind of like talk about each of them um, generally. Of course, these saved in a weird order. All right. I think we're almost there. All right. I think the last of these are just microphones and headphones. Um, all right. Um, Again, these saved in a weird order. So what I have here are um, a bunch of audio interfaces, uh, which essentially I have. This is the older version, but that same one here. Um, it essentially goes from a microphone input uh, to USB of some sort into your computer and then some of them pretty much all of them can output the sound through your uh, whatever speakers you hook up to it um, I think this is an important piece of gear to have uh, and you don't need to get a super crazy one in order to make recordings um, what I will say uh, in my experience of working with them is basically never get one that only has one channel or can handle one microphone uh, pretty much always go for the, the stereo one. Uh, the, you'll have much a wider variety of options, and you'll find very quickly that there's something where you wish you could record it in stereo and you just can't. And it'll usually be cheaper than having to buy two separate mono things, and that can run into a whole bunch of issues with your computers. Um, so I think uh, there's a variety of them uh, at different price points. Not that one. Uh, kind of the two I would recommend for the lower price points. Uh, there's kind of this one by PreSonus that does two. Um, and then it, it's just USBs into your computer. Um, and then it can do speakers and headphones and stuff with MIDI and all of that. Um, but there's, cool that it takes MIDI. I haven't, I haven't seen that before. Yeah. I haven't used it. I own one of these, but it's currently at work because they bought speakers, but nothing to connect the speakers to the computer to. So I brought my extra one over there. 
Um, but this, it does a lot. I like this one too because you can, there's this mixer knob, and if you turn it all the way one way, it'll just pass through the microphone uh, output to the, through the speakers. If you turn it all the way the other way, it's just the computer playback sound coming out of the speakers in the back. Uh, and if you put it right in the middle, it's, it's both evenly. Also, the headphone amp goes up to 11, so. Um, something like that the, uh, for a little bit more. Um, I think the the Scarlet line by by Focusrite is a, a decent one, and it's you know they're both metal, but it's got a nice hefty metal case to it. It just feels sturdy, and it's not too heavy. Um, if if you run into a case where you need to record more than two things at once. Um, it might be worth investing in something a little bit bigger. Uh, this one's another Scarlet, but it can do um, it can do a total of four inputs, so three and four, and then one and two are on the front. Um, this is the uh, this is the new version of the big one I have at my home station. Uh, if I were to move my camera, you can see part of it right there. Um, uh, but this is a, a very a very big one, so you get uh, a total of like eight microphone inputs, and then a whole bunch of line uh, options. Um, and those ones of this size by different brands, again, it kind of depends on what you like and what your budget is. But they're generally all around that that five hundred dollar mark. Um, bo -bo -bo, that's a different thing. Um, but yeah, so I, I recommend some. You know, something small and portable is a great thing to have because um, you may not want to record everything in your living room or you may live next to a, a busy intersection or a bus stop or something. You don't want to pick up those sounds. So getting something that's portable will let you be able to easily pack it all up and go somewhere to record someone playing your stuff. Um, so that that's my big recommendation. And then they make bigger ones if you need more microphones. I think all of these can do eight microphones, these big ones I've listed right here. Another yeah, and be careful with what they, uh, I mean, you might have, you might have been about to say this, but sometimes you'll see things that's like, especially when you start looking at higher end stuff, you'll see like 24 channel inputs and you're like, oh, wow, that's, I mean, how would I record <laughs> 24 second. things? And they are counting stereo at double. So it's really yeah. like 12 inputs uh, there. Yeah, yeah, it's like uh, they do other weird calculations, and they, or sometimes they're like, "Well, really, it's only eight SLRs, and this, you know, you can do yeah. uh, coaxial, you know." Uh, yeah, if, if you were to, I'm going to show this one on the computer next, but if you go to the YouTube thing and look at this after the the latency hits, it's got eight of the um, of those mic inputs, and then the next two channels are nine, ten, and eleven, twelve. So you can technically have twelve independent things, but but not really. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that that's a, a big big thing to be aware of. Uh, you definitely want to check and see what each of those inputs actually are. Um, same thing with the outputs; they usually count the headphones as a as their own unique output. Um, so if it says it can route to 40 things, see what those 40 options are uh, before you just buy one. Don't, don't just go with the highest number. Um, all right. So a few different options for rather than having an interface, uh, there's a few different ways you could work out recording things. So what an interface does is essentially just an extra circuit board you plug into your computer. Uh, and it, when you use it with your DAWs, it essentially you can make a separate track for each thing that you have plugged into it. Um, what I have here, this is the same mixer I just showed on the table. Uh, this is a mixer, but it can also be an interface, which is why I like it. Um, and what a mixer does is it essentially takes all, has all the inputs like an interface would, uh, and you can apply some effects um, right there usually. Um, the basic ones just collect things and adjust volume, but then it just sums it into a stereo output um, and sends it off to do whatever you would want to do with it. Again, this one here I could use as an interface, there's a little switch on the back, or just a mixer. 
Um, this is another way. It's about the same price, this particular one, as some of the other uh, ones I just had on the screen. But it's a great way to uh, you know, get things around and plug in a whole bunch of stuff all at once. And you can um, th this one you can set levels and effects. And uh, I really like it as well because you can... Um, you can actually record things directly to an SD card on the mixer uh, and you can give up to five unique headphones their own separate mixes and things like that for performers and it does a lot. The one thing I hate about it is the body is made of plastic. So like it's a it's a decently hard plastic but uh, you'd still want to be careful taking it places. Um, so that, that's my one Thing. I'm not going to go into how to use a mixer unless people really want me to. Um, but you can do a variety of stuff and have presets and other settings and things like that. Um, yeah, maybe don't go, I mean, I, I, maybe people, I mean, you could. But uh, the, yeah. I, I think this is what I'm thinking of. Aren't, aren't some of these, like, so these can, like, talk back to each other, right? So you're, uh, when you're looking at these sort of digital mixers and recorders, they can process sound from your computer not just you know like sending it out to your speakers and running you can like route it through like effects pedals and all sorts of other stuff if you have something like this that you can't easily do uh with an interface is that correct so like or if i'm like i don't know if i'm a video game streamer i think these are really popular right now because you can mix the video game sound with your voice and put that into a general reverb and so it sounds like you're in the space and so you're able to do effects like that so um it's just that's what this is, right? That you Essentially, yeah. So, like, you could um, say you had your voice in channel one and the the uh, other stuff in, you know, two, three, four, whatever. You could send each of them through uh, an effect, and you could, in this one, you could pick it here and set it all there. And then it'll sum it all up in stereo, send it out the master channel, um, either to your speakers or through USB to your computer, however you want. Uh, this one... I'm sure you could work out a way to, to do it. I've not been in a scenario to where you could have things easily come from your computer to this to then work out the the onboard effects. Um, that might involve going from like one of the outputs, like your headphone jack on the computer, into an input over here, processing it, and then sending it back to the computer. That's, I think it can be done just from the USB. But let me dive into it now. Yeah, on, on this particular one, I don't know. I've... I've always, uh, I've been the kind of guy who plugs all the stuff in kind of like with a, a big synthesizer uh, and routes it manually. I That would be a great thing to do. I've just never done it. Um, so that would also make life very easy. Um, but they have these kind of mixers at a variety of, of sizes depending on what you need, just like the interfaces. Just You don't have to get an interface as your only option. Um, one other thing to kind of wrap out the or most of the recording is a handheld recorder um, they make these um, I like the zoom ones uh, they make cheaper ones uh, but I've never had anything go wrong with a zoom recorder and I've had them you know had them before for years um, but they make a variety of them this is kind of like the um, actually that's the h2 where's the h1 you know this is like the cheapest one um, here it's just a little handheld thing with some microphones this one's got a bigger microphone set up. Um, this is the one that I currently have. Um, and I like this one because um, the microphones on the top can be interchanged with different ones. So you can get one recorder and then spend your money on the microphone capsules so you don't have to get a whole bunch of different options. But they have, a, again, a variety just depending on what you need. But you can very easily take this places and record it, and they have decent quality microphones. Um, and on some of them, you can even plug in your own external microphones um, so that way you, you don't even have to carry around a, a big old interface to go record stuff. It's super portable. Um, so anything about... Dan, I, w I was basically going to spend the last chunk of time just bringing up like microphones and headphones and stuff to, to work with that. Um, but if anyone has anything specific they want to mention, uh, bring that up. So I tell my students, I will take that silence as a no. Um, all right. 
So uh, right here, um, so the microphones, just like uh, monitor speakers, are probably the, the most expensive thing you, you can potentially buy for your kind of gear setup. Uh, be, uh, that's partly because any, not this isn't universally true, but basically uh, any microphone that that's good to get is gonna, you know, be comprised of you know several hundred dollars worth of you know precise and expensive equipment, um, and the companies who make them also know that, um, so they're just gonna cost a a good chunk of money. Uh, but it's important because that's the microphone you use will directly change how the recording sounds, and I'm not gonna get into a whole bunch of details about that. Um, what I will say is if you only had to get like a single microphone, uh, the one I would recommend starting off with is this one on the screen here, the Shure SM58. Um, it's great for vocals. It's kind of generally what it's uh, designed for, um, but it's a sturdy mic. They're very, not impossible, but very hard to break. Uh, you could potentially use it for anything and they don't require any extra electricity to work with. Um, so you could very easily hook up a few of them by your uh, performers and record them, plug it into your uh, mixer, your handheld recorder, and get a, a decent recording off of that. I, I would not use them for like large space or like large ensemble recordings because uh, they're they're a little more narrow. Like they they drop off in terms of sensitivity after a ways. Um, but these you know. Generally, they'll last you a long time, and they aren't terribly expensive. Um, the fifty, the SM fifty seven uh, is a, is basically the exact same mic, but with a different shaped head, so it works better for instruments and drums and things like that. Um, I I own these, but that's only because there was a like a buy two get one deal on this when I was at the store one day. Um, so that's the only reason I currently have this and not an SM fifty eight. Um, other I mean, than kind of having both is like the, they're like so even finding them used they're just so reliable like the reason yeah. Rockstar has used them for a decade right like you can yeah, throw them just, on stage and then yeah. alright next gig next night it pops right back up and like it's really hard to get a buzz or it's really hard to break them so like having one of each is, um, get, even finding one used somewhere it's like it's a pretty sure bet yeah I'm, I'm planning on getting uh, one or two of them um, next paycheck um but yeah, but um, like I said, they'll work for anything. If if you are in a place where you can get a few extra microphones, I would recommend getting like one for some instruments, one for some vocals, stuff like that. Having a variety, um, I think at a similar price point, the um, Audio Technica the AT twenty twenty is good for voices and um, some instruments, like some some winds and things like that. Uh, it's a different kind of microphone. I could go into like the details of how of how the different microphones work if you want, but it, it's a a different one. It's a condenser instead of a dynamic. But the the main thing to know is that this one requires extra electricity to work. Most devices, um, most either interfaces or mixers, if they connect to the computer or you've plugged them in, they have the ability to send that electricity down through the microphone cables. Um, and it'll work just automatically. It's uh, called phantom power, or you may see it on the device. It's, it's uh, if I can get close to the camera, it's 48 volts, so you might see a 48V on the box as a switch. Could be useful. Um, but I think um, this is a, a general, you know, not as sturdy, but just sturdy, all right, microphone, um, for, uh, particularly for voices and things of that nature. Um, this is the one I have right here. Um, it's a little more pricey, but it's um, it's a good. It's another dynamic microphone, but it's a low output, so you need something to boost it. And that's why they're selling this as a bundle. Um, this is one of kind of like again, it's more pricey, but it's the um, like one of the most used podcast uh, video recording voiceover type microphones. Uh, one of the anecdotes is that. Uh, Thriller was recorded on one of these back in the 80s. Um, I just think that's a fun story. But um, but yeah, no, they, they work great. They're just a little more pricey, but it's got a, a better, more delicate response than some of the other microphones. Um, I'm just going to kind of quickly go through some of these because um, they're, they're 
microphone, but we can't really see a lot of them. I don't want to go get out my, all my other microphones because I only have so much time. Um, but basically, you can spend whatever you want on microphones. I'm just on the screen here. I'm just pulling up some of the ones that I like at a, a few various uh, price points. I like this one because it's it records in stereo. Um, and it, it does take a special cable, but it comes with the the cable and adapter stuff, um, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then if you can get a, a, a what's a stereo pair or a matched pair, these are microphones that have been calibrated to work specifically in stereo together. So you use both of them together, um, and they'll pick up a, a great stereo field uh, by working with each other. Um, and I'll have that here. Um, I like these large diaphragm microphones. I just think they have a, a nice, generally speaking, warm, open sound for vocals. Um, but everyone has different preferences. Um, I want one of I want a set of these ones very badly, but one of them it's a thousand dollars, so um, you know that's how it be. All right, so the last section I want to bring up is uh, USB microphones. I think these are a great uh, thing to have, both starting off and in general. <laughs> USB microphone. Um, basically, a lot of the ones I just brought up have their own uh, a USB version of themselves, and they just connect right into your computer's USB port without um, without needing any extra um, hardware. Which is one reason why I like them. You just you'll have to do any kind of uh, manipulation on the levels and things like that, uh, either on the microphone itself or in the computer. That's one of the, the downsides. Um, I want to check this one out. This one's fairly new by AKG, but it's USB-C, so that might be kind of cool. Um, but then uh, the same eight, uh, Audio Technica I showed you has a USB version. So um, again, a lot of these microphones will have a, um, a USB uh, counterpoint or counterpart to how they normally work. Um, and these are fairly common, you'll see in a lot of home studios. And they're generally not terribly expensive. Um, these are just some more microphones of varying types. And uh, if you if money is no object to you, um, I would rec I, I like the Neumann microphones, but they're 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 pricey and they know it. Um, I just I like the way they sound. Um, I think they're nice and high quality, but um, they're, they're expensive. Microphones can run for whatever you want to do. Um, the last thing I want to bring up are headphones. Um, so uh, when you're doing your recording, either uh, and doing any kind of editing after the fact, or um, you know whether you want your performer to be able to hear stuff, headphones are important. I don't want to get them out because my camera here is in the way. But this is the, the pair I generally have at home. Um, and I use a lot. If you actually just look up AKG K240 on Sweetwater, you can find this video here, and they kind of go through a bunch of the different, uh, you know, kinds of headphones. Um, but really, it just kind of depends on what. Uh, you know, there's not a comparison thing on this page uh, on what you're looking for um, and what feels comfortable on your head. But basically, being able to to listen and record all your stuff on headphones is important. Um, because you may not always be in a spot where you can have big fancy speakers, you may not have any speakers at all, um, things like that. You may want to really be able to um, monitor stuff. Uh, it's just a nice flexible thing to have. Um, but just like microphones and monitors, you can spend as much as you want on just a single pair of headphones. They can be very pricey. Those are speakers. Um, so. Yeah, basically, look and see what what fits for you. Um, do you want it to have a big open back or something that's uh, closed off? They they all do slightly different things, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into that. My last thing is speakers, and speakers are very expensive as well for anything that's good. Um, I found that for the price point, this particular pair of PreSonus speakers, or the ones I have in here, are affordable and well built, um, and they're uh, you know PreSonus is based in Baton Rouge, so you wouldn't have a lot of shipping issues normally. Um, 
but basically you can plug in your stuff and hear it back. There's a variety of sound of sizes that can change depending on what you need it for. But uh, speakers can help you know just get a better representation of your sound. I I really wouldn't recommend on anything below this kind of price point because at that point the quality of materials start to suffer. But you can very easily spend thousands of dollars on a set of speakers. So just kind of depends on what you you're really looking for. Um, Got a few minutes left. Don't know if you have any questions. I kind of regret using my camera. I don't think that worked out as well as I envisioned, but uh, we got through it. Live and learn, brother. Live and All learn. Right. So, uh, so here's the thing. So I'm still like, I don't know. I feel like I've learned a lot uh, tonight, but also like still have things from I've been told in the past. I'm trying to like get some of those uh, sort of nasty things out of my. <laughs> uh, like. All right. So here's the thing, right? So you were talking about monitors here. You're talking about speakers. Uh, I've heard in the past to not get a subwoofer, that like what happens is you get a subwoofer, you start hearing the bass more present in your in your things, and uh, that's great, but like, you know, it's great for listening to records or something or like chilling out and like when you fine tuning your own home studio, but it's not really the sort of case that, you know, like headphones don't have subwoofers, in them, right? So what is your sort of like experience with that? Do you have any advice? Um, because I have I have the JBL, I think it showed me at the bottom the comparison, and they sell a subwoofer, and I've just been like, I don't know, I don't think I should get that. So what are your sort of thoughts? Yeah. Um, I think if you have a way to, uh, you know, either turn the subwoofer off or on, uh, but still have your other speakers, then get it. Uh, that that's what I would say, and I say that because. Um, Basically, when you're doing all of your mixing and editing and stuff like that, say you, you went and recorded you know, Bob playing your uh, keyboard piece or whatever, uh, or you're making some big audio production in uh, you know, Pro Tools or whatever, and you're doing all your mixing, and the, basically the, the worse speakers you can get them sounding good on, that, that'll translate up to when you have better speakers and a better bass. Um, Gen generally speaking um so if, if you can you know get it sounding decent with that and then you know work on and add some stuff in the the base in that would be great i think um i think if, unless you just really need it it's not something you absolutely have to have but it's nice to have because then you, you understand how things work in that base range but you are right if i was to you know, plug in my, my cell phone headphones, it's not going to be anywhere near the the same kind of bass response. So you'd almost be wasting your time. I think it also depends on, you know, what your audience is and how they're going to be listening to it. So Yeah, for sure. I and mean, it depends on, like, where projects. So if you're, like, doing film stuff, every movie theater has some has many subwoofer surrounding people. And so it's definitely something that is used yeah. uh, and can be used effectively. I mean, obviously... Yeah, having that mix that works on everything, super important. So I don't know. I'm still like he hesitated. I have one in my home five one sort of like oh, this is uh, five one setup. I have a subwoofer, but I don't have one in my like professional mixer. Yeah, setting. I like I said, I want to get one. Maybe not this exact one. I just looked for the the closest subwoofer on the thing. Um, I think it's nice to have the um, to have the option to do that base. I don't think it's strictly necessary if you can get everything sounding nice and, and good on a a worse set of speakers so yeah i wish i had it when i was throwing parties in undergrad but now <laughs> it's like you know it's a right little, little bit now i'm like oh now i have you know the jbl served me well just with monitors yeah. for that for the song, so. a question that i have sort of on the flip side of the, the question about monitors is about sound paneling. Um, until I get like my own house or my subterranean composition layer or whatever, <laughs> um, I re I want a good sound. Like I want bass that will blow the hair off All off right. of my head. Like I want just this enveloping. I can it's massaging my face kind of right. sound. Um, however, my housemates probably don't. Um, so until that time, uh, is there something that I can do? Obviously good headphones, but um, I don't always want to be wearing something. Right. So is there something that you know I can put on some of the walls to help 
absorb that sound? Yes. Um, I'm sure there is, but you yes. have a recommendation. So, um, well, the, there's a few things. The first is having, uh, on this speaker, It's they have little nubs. On other ones, you can like put them on foam to kind of help isolate the speaker and it's not vibrating everything. Mm-hmm. That, that'll help a little bit with the, the sound bleed just in general. Um, but let me uh, go to Amazon real quick and see. Uh, I'll let you pull up your soundproofing. Uh, it depends on like budgets and all that sort of stuff. Right. Like also, I'm a renter, and so I'm very cognizant of like getting panels and pasting individually on a wall. Probably not yeah. a great idea. So, right. Um, but like even just blankets on rods suspended, like heavy comforters and stuff, will dampen a lot. Um, right. If you're that that's like one way to go and i know people who film me do that because it's easier if they want a more reflective sound it's a lot easier to pull that off and put it back on yeah as opposed to like sound paneling well you just created a sort of like uh very very dry space and there's no way to get wet right as you put sound paneling right. you can't get the reverb back yeah, so um, um that's one thing i mean matt might have better suggestions but... yeah. so like i said it, it's a little different for each room and each spot you're in uh these kinds of things, these panels you can just stick up on the wall, I think are a great quick solution. Um, they're not, you know, perfect, um, but that could get you some stuff. And then there's um, things like this, these kind of more solid panels that act more like Thomas was saying with the blankets. And essentially, um, you're wanting the sound to, if it goes up against the wall, to not, you know, hit the wall and travel through it. You want it to diffuse out uh, away from the wall so it's not traveling through stuff. Uh, the best solution is to build a wall yourself and stuff it with insulation, but that's not very easy or practical to do. Um, but having stuff like this that you can put on the wall um, is is pretty... Uh, it's probably the easiest thing to go about doing. They have some of these that are specific, like sheets that are specifically designed for that. I will say, don't just like hang them up and like try to make a booth out of just the sound absorbing sheets. I mean, it'll kind of work, but not really. I, I had to talk out, talk my principal out of doing that as a way to make a sound booth for a class I'm teaching next year. Um, because, because it, it there, there's a top you need to figure this. It doesn't work. Uh, but you need the wall there as well. The wall will, will do a lot of that sound blocking as well. But, this kind of foam or the um, these kind of high density panels, uh, th- those are relatively cheap and easy to to put up and take down. Um, you could also this is more for recording, but you could also get a little isolation kind of mini box that goes around stuff. Um, but that that'll that'll help with some of the loudness and the the bassiness. Um, I would also experiment. Another to make... thing for renters, you can get the sound paneling and like put them like you go to an art supply store and get a giant canvas and then apply it to that. Then you can hang it on a wall and then take it. You know, your guests come over, <laughs> you take it off the wall, put it in the closet, right? Um, yeah. Right. As opposed to like you know, I when I was in my master's, I had these and I was like using oh, what's it called? The little pull it C- and command it strips. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so I had those, and like they would work and stuff, and it was fine. But like then they kind of a permanent fixture. They don't damage the wall or right. anything. They, they make some Velcro like ones. Um, if that's right. so you can pull them off. I, I was gonna say that yeah, works. Or yeah, you have those little things on your wall, and it's, you know you have you have a partner come over, and you're like, hey, this is, and then you have to explain, oh, this is for soundproofing. Not, I'm, I don't just like hanging foam on the wall. I think nowadays it's more common, so maybe it's not so bad. Yeah, I'll say that, um, and then. With these foam ones, you, if you get big enough thumbtacks, you could just thumbtack it and it wouldn't leave a huge hole when you took it off. Um, stuff like that. Right. I guess I didn't, I was gonna say, I didn't specifically talk about DAWs, but just like the notation software, it kind of depends on what works best for you and what you're doing. Uh, for the money, Audacity is the best one because you don't pay anything. But if you're trying to do anything like at all, you're gonna want something that's not Audacity. Um, if you have a, a Mac, uh, it's easy to get Logic, and that one's pretty user friendly. Uh, once, if you, in my experience, it took a little to get used to it, but Live was fine. Pro Tools is Pro Tools. Um, um, I was while we've been talking about equipment. Be sure um, I said I was that. Also <laughs> on a chat 
with somebody from East West about their Hollywood choirs and about um, notation. And, and he said, it doesn't really work with notation um, because the, the memory burden is so high and it causes yeah. stability issues. Um, and he said it just works better in a DAW, and he was recommending Cubase. Um, what do you okay. think of that? Uh, I've actually, I don't have Cubase, do I? I didn't think I did. Um, I've actually not used Cubase before, so if anyone's got better experience with that, I'd love to hear it. Um, yeah, sure, I've used it. Uh, it's, I mean, they are all very similar. They do things in slightly different approaches, but I think the like for the composer side of things, the one that integrates best with your notation app is like kind of the best of both worlds. It's like it's kind of really well known that uh, Sibelius and Pro Tools are industry standards in terms of like Hollywood and that kind of stuff because uh, Sibelius can talk to Pro Tools and Pro Tools can has a little uh, little notation editor in there that can easily go to Sibelius, right? And they can communicate to each other. Um, with Cubase, it's the same with Dorico um, that pairs up with. So if you can have Dorico notation software. Uh, Finale is off on its own. Logic's off on its own. Audacity is way off on its own. Um, I think MuseScore is on its own now where they're working to integrate it with another free doll uh, that's in the work. So um, keep your eyes peeled on that. Maybe like three or four years down the road, there might be free notation and free dolls for everyone. But, uh, until then, yeah. I mean, like, so uh, Cubase itself is like totally fine to use. I've had no issues with it. Um, I, I don't think Ableton has any sort of notation either. And Ableton's no. probably you know, a live performer in that kind yeah of it's, it's a little more of a live setting um you could use it for mixing stuff actually my uh my midi mixer which i had on the screen earlier uh just natively connects into ableton and everything automatically maps and controls so you can use it for for mixing stuff but it's super useful for live things um but yeah they're all i think for the price and if you're an apple user like the first doll or whatever logic pro is like 200 bucks and it's like never under 200 bucks it's like just like a constant 200 bucks but it does come with a ton of sound libraries and everything it if does. you haven't used the doll before um you buy it and it's kind of uh unless there's a major update in like four years or so like you have it and the, even the old versions are supported and stuff too so and I, there's a lot a lot yeah. of documentation out there for it it's been around since the 90s so yeah i will say one um, thing uh, sorry, i was gonna say that i think it's a great deal if you want to if you have a Mac and want to buy Logic, um, uh, let's see, what was this called? Um, I brought to you by your local Apple salesman here. Yeah. 100% uh, so <laughs> not sponsored. Um, there we are. This um, Pro Apps Bundle for Education. Basically, you just have to prove that you're a student, but you get Logic. <laughs> Final Cut, which is a video editing software. I've never used these other ones, but I'm sure they do great things. Um, Motion is some graphics tool, compressor, encodes, files, um, main stage. Basically, I think it's like their version of Ableton. It's gotten better. It was really terrible on launch, but yeah. it's gotten better since the last six years or so. Yeah. so. But it's like uh, still not. It's still. I mean, Ableton still like like if you're a live performer you're using Ableton. Yeah. It's, it's still I'm just saying, but since Logic itself is two hundred dollars and Final Cut by itself is three hundred dollars, I mean, you you can get all five of these for the price of Logic. So never buy just Logic. I always say buy buy this bundle. Um, and even if you never use the apps, you're not out anything. Well, I, I appreciate the non-sponsored uh, recommendation, uh, but I use PCs. And I, Something completely I, different. You know, I, I will, no, that's uh, totally fine. Uh, I will say, uh, if you can afford it, having something that runs Mac OS and something that runs Windows is a great idea. Um, I've got a um, a Windows laptop that also I use for gaming when it's not the semester, but it's also a computer. Um, but basically, whenever you you make something, um, this is more in like the computer music realm. But you want to make sure it runs on everything. Um, so if you can, if you do that kind of stuff, and you can get you know one of each, just check it on everything to make sure nothing breaks. Um, so. And then, and then you never have to worry about not being able to run a software. 
Um, we're gonna say having, having already blown well over a thousand dollars for <laughs> this to use for class, and two thirty-two inch high definition monitors and software and a new <laughs> PC. Like I'm sort of tapped out on on equipment for a while. That's that's not a oh, so That was last term. I'm sorry. Yeah, but still, uh, we got a new loan for this one. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm gonna. Yeah, I know. Uh, a, a friend of mine is a multi instrumentalist, and he says, you know, I travel around with five thousand, ten thousand dollars worth of music instruments in the back of my car, and I struggle to get to a gig that'll pay me a hundred bucks. Yeah, <laughs> so. that's how it is. That's unfortunately all the stuff is a little pricey. So, um, it's, like, it's one of those things that like you know you kind of like get a list when you're starting off and then like check the one that's most important like if you don't have any way to if you only have earbuds or something and that's your only way to listen to music like the first thing you're going to want to get is some headphones right you don't need to jump to getting an audio interface and then go get some speakers and then go uh yeah and if you can't create if you don't have a notation program at all well then yeah you get a notation software right so like having this sort of incremental thing uh anytime i get a gig you know Building commission, or I'm working on a project or a game or something. I like try to take as much money as that as I can, like put it back into the studio and just piece by piece build together. Uh, you know, you're still in poverty, but then like you got a little bit of extra stuff to work on. So maybe the next project you work on, you have you have the equipment to make it a little bit better, but that's something that you made the prior and so on and so forth. And then, you know, regression. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that's what I was gonna recommend is just starting bit by bit i have if anyone ever comes over and looks at all of my stuff i've accumulated it over a, a decade plus of buying a little bit here and a little bit there um but yeah that's you just slightly add to it and all of a sudden you'll have 40 microphones in a box and not know what to do and uh i didn't and we we either ticked off david or he, he lost his internet connection Oh no, oh no, oh no. All right. Um, oh, there he is. <laughs> oh, there you go. Here he's back. Now. Sorry about that. I, mm. That's all right. I, I was just uh, confirming what Thomas said of don't, don't buy everything all at once unless you are independently wealthy. Piece it up bit by bit. No, but this was really helpful. Um, I have a decent pair of headphones, but I definitely want to I invest in a, in a much better pair. I need better monitors because I've only got these little dinky things back here. Um, and the, I may not need a subwoofer, but the bass on these is atrocious. Yeah. It's just useless. So it's fine for a Zoom call, but... Exactly. Yeah, my overall, my, my suggestion is um, don't go for, like, the absolute cheapest for any gear the absolute cheapest unless that's all you can get um don't sue me company but i'll, I'll almost never buy anything from behringer um like i this just just don't you'll you'll end up buying a replacement after six months um uh, um and that, that don't sue me thing's a whole other story but um but buy, buy like the next level up above that and you you know, just get creative, and it'll it'll work out better than you you think it will. And if you get used to working with the really bad stuff, once you get the the better things, it, life just gets much easier. Um, but yeah, don't 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 get like the basement level like twenty dollar all in one sets unless you that's just all you can get. Uh, at which point, that's what you get, um, and you you learn to work with it. But um, I think it's worth it in the long run to buy something a little more pricey, and then it just won't break. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I think you got like I think if you had like five hundred bucks and you had nothing, I think you could get into it. I think like you'd be able to piece enough together, and like uh, I mean, that's to me that's a lot of money. But it, you know, it's always like that's. That's the that's the goal, right? You know, if uh, if this was a hobby, you know, maybe you spend like you know, uh, I know people who spend like a hundred bucks on the weekend partying and stuff. And I was like, well, how do you do that? Do you <laughs> yeah. Do that? yeah. So uh, instead of you know, so maybe that maybe that's your problem. But like, yeah, so like it's doable. And I think like the goal of like having something by the end of undergrad, and then by the time that you're ready to like you know go out and be professional and 
Um, and then maybe that's in the undergrad, then you have that, you have that ready to go. And then like each gig leads to more gear and more equipment. So, um, any other questions for Matt? I have one other thing we need to talk about. If not. Thanks, Matt. Cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Let's hope, oh, let's say, I hope, I hope this was informative. If you, you think of something or have any kind of gear questions, I, I, I don't think of myself as a gear expert uh, very much, but I'd be more than happy to give my two cents about stuff. Are you definitely the gear expert here? So thanks for thanks for doing right. this.